master class where Victor Palachek advanced studies for the clarinet. Today we'll be covering A214 after Ricard Strauss's opera Ariad on Naxos. And for anyone who's been watching since day one, we are officially halfway through the method books. So thank you so much for clicking and watching, and I hope you've enjoyed this series so far. Now a little bit of background on the work. This opera is about Agyane, and the myth tells about how Prince Theseus of Athens set out for Crete to kill the Minotaur, a uh, half horse, half bull, half man creature who was concealed in a labyrinth. Uh, Princess Ariadne of Crete falls in love with Theseus and gives him a ball of thread that's enabled him to find his way out of the labyrinth. That way he can kill the Minotaur. Uh, when Theseus leaves Crete, he takes Ariadne with him as his bride. During this voyage home, they stop at the island of Naxos. While Ariadne is asleep, Theseus slips away and continues his journey to Athens without her. This is the basic story and synopsis of this opera, to the best of my knowledge. Um, like all of Strauss's works and Wagner too, which we're covering in the next etude, a lot of their work revolves around mytho mythological uh, creatures and stories. So I think this etude is really fun in the sense that we have a narrative that's already put in place. So as you're playing this, take some time to do a little bit of research and understand the opera and the way that you can inject some thematic um, programmatic energy into this compared to the other etudes that we played before. So overall, I believe the main objective for this etude is to create even, well-paced trills that link the melodic material throughout. Uh, this is definitely a trill study. Um, no other etude in this book has this many trills, so this is definitely the focus of the etude if we're trying to pick a category or a topic to give it. In particular, we will be working with some trills that are a bit more challenging to control in my opinion. So the first thing that I would suggest is devoting some time to practicing each individual trill and study on its own. Um, a few of these also have more than one way of being played, so you'll also have to decide which option best suits you, works for you. Uh, for your reference, I've included all the trill fingers that I use at the end of this masterclass for your reference in case that is useful to you. For now, we'll just work on a few that are a little more difficult to navigate and I'll give you some tips on those. So starting in measure one, we are on the boat on our way to Naxos. <laughs> Uh, we have an E4 trill that we need to be playing up to an F sharp for. Now, depending on your clarinet pitch tendencies, you may find it easier to use the left hand thumb or the bottom two side keys on the right hand for this particular trill. Uh, I would say for the best pitch consistency, you want to use the left hand fingering using the thumb, lifting the thumb from an E. And then for the best speed consistency, obviously the bottom two side keys are going to give you a little bit more motion and movement because the thumb is not often used other than the register key and the back tone hole. So, that being said, we really want to understand our pitch tendencies on all these trills. Um, in my form in particular, the E to F sharp runs a little high, so I have to really take that lower with the voicing if I want to get a good consistent trill. So, make sure that you understand your tendencies first, and then you understand your hand position, your technique. Uh, I think the technique and hand position really play a huge role in trilling because the smallest movements can sometimes be the best movements. Um, more movement does not always equal faster, more tension does not equal faster, so being as efficient as possible, knowing your tendencies, and practicing consistently is gonna be your best bet to a good trill on any note of the clarinet. So for practicing these, let's go to measure three, and we're gonna go from the E5 to F sharp five trill. Now for me, it's always really helpful to set my measure down to a very slow tempo marking. Um, not too slow, let's just say quarter note equals 50. Next, I'm going to start alternating between the E and F sharp on quarter notes. Next, I'm going to start playing them as eighth notes, then triplets, then sixteenth notes, then thirty-second notes. So, as you can see, we're trying to create a nice gradient up to the highest subdivision. Um, with time, consistency, we don't want to start at the highest subdivision and try and figure out the in-between. That gray matter is what kind of trips us up and then we can lose control and then it doesn't sound musical or paced or expressive. So. Doing this, it really provides us with the understanding of how to activate each trill. Because, um, you know, in my opinion, every trill on the clarinet is not created equally. Some of these are a little bit more tricky depending on which finger you're using. I find that the trill fingerings with the pinkies can be a little bit demanding um, compared to the index finger trills, which, you know, the index finger is definitely a stronger finger, so to me, that is a little bit easier to play. So, when you're practicing these, use a mirror. Uh, make sure that the air pressure behind each note, each trill is focused. We really want to hear both notes. Uh, we want to create velocity and brilliance and make sure that everything sounds as easy as possible. 
Now for trimming technique, I've heard several methods, but what works best for me is really quite simple. At the end of the day, I maintain the same hand position that I always use, no matter what I'm playing. Um, that means using a minimal amount of space between the fingers, lighting the touch, and maintaining the position. I'm really trying to create efficient, even movements. When I'm trailing, I'm going from the knuckle, the joint knuckle, all the way to the fingertip. I think a lot of people make the mistake of trailing too much and putting too much pressure on the actual fingertip itself. I think this creates too much tension and too much weight, and it just creates more sluggishness and uh, delays in the overall technique that we're trying to accomplish no matter what we're playing. So things to remember when you're trailing, make sure that you're trailing from the knuckle to the fingertip. Hand position is critical. Use a mirror. Uh, even movements, consistent movements, thoughtful movements, good air. And that's pretty much it. I think, uh, you know, we're really going for quality over quantity when we're practicing these. Uh, I never practice these fast when I do my warm-ups. If I do play them fast, it's because I've taken them from a slow subdivision to a fast one. Um, you know, the sky's the limit with the way you want to practice these. You can practice them with arpeggios, major scales, um, whatever makes sense to you. You know, keep it interesting, challenge yourself, do a variety of things because, you know, when we have trills in music, they're not always going to be scalar, they're not always going to make a lot of sense at times. So the more you can diversify the way you're practicing these, the better off they'll be when you're presented with a solo piece or an ensemble piece that calls for them. Now moving on, in this A2 we have several B4 to C5 trills. Um, we could talk about other tr trills in this study, but I think this one's really important just because it needs a pinky to be activated. Now for pinky trills, the best advice that I can give you is to allow the key to do the work for you. What I mean by this is to allow the actual mechanism of the key work to help you create the trill. Specifically, you're gonna wanna use just enough pressure to press down and then just let the key work come up for you. Um, when you press any key on the clarinet that uses the pinky, if you press down, the key is gonna come up no matter what, if your clarinet's working correctly. <laughs> so, you know, for me, I'm not lifting my pinky. I think that most teachers are gonna advise you to not do this. Um, if you're keeping your hand position in a good, consistent way, you shouldn't be lifting your pinkies any higher than maybe like half an inch, ideally. An inch, you know, I see people doing this all the time, do what you want, but to me that makes my skin crawl just because I feel like that's just, you know, inefficient. So I'm very pragmatic and I make sure that everything has an intention. Um, when we're doing the pinky trills, these have to be as intentional as possible because if not, they can sound a little messy and it's just really hard to get the note going. So. For the B4 to C5 trills, what I'm basically doing is I'm kind of anchoring on the note, so I'm pressing down and then kind of letting it move, and then I kind of get the speed. Now this is definitely easier using the technique and the practice method that we covered just a few minutes ago. Um, this is a really good one to practice on. You can practice from the B to a C, C to C sharp, B on the right to C, C5 to D on the left. It's up to you. But my goal when I practice these is to make sure that no matter what key I'm activating with the pinky, the pinky is able to create a consistent drill no matter what the context. In measure six, we have an A4 that will need to be trilled up to a B4. Now for this trill, we are gonna to have to do some trial and error to really understand the tendencies of our clarinet. Since we are dealing with a throat tone trill that is notoriously unstable on many clarinets, you will need to do some experimenting to figure out how to vent or place additional fingers down on the right hand to adjust the timbre and the pitch. For an A4 to B or B flat 4 trill, try experimenting with fingers 2 and 3 in the left hand since you will have the right index finger active for these trills. Um, and you know, let's take a step back. If you've never used these trill fingerings up top, what we're basically going to do is use our index finger. I use the top joint, so the line that connects this joint right here on the finger. For me, it's pretty much just resting on the key and then I'm pressing into the clarinet. Again, I'm not lifting my finger away. I'm just really trying to create even movement and maintain the position of the hands. So going forward, let's talk about venting just a little bit more. These trills really benefit from venting just as we would play them on their own. 
That means putting down fingers to create a better timbre and pitch center for the particular note. So if I'm playing an A to a B natural, for me, I find it's best to keep my second finger and my third finger down with the A key, and then I'm playing the top control key. Uh, for B flat, I have a different configuration that I've figured out for my clarinet. You'll need to figure out what's best for you. Um, if you don't do anything, sometimes it works depending on your instrument, but oftentimes it sounds really unfocused and pitchy. So take some time to really understand your tendencies and then go from there. Now that we've discussed the ways in which you create the trills, I think the best thing that you can do for this A2 is to make it as musical as possible by changing the pacing of each trill depending on the phrasing. Now, because there are no written dynamics in this besides the initial mental forte at the beginning, it'll really be up to you to develop your own unique interpretation. For me, I found it really effective to play my trills with varying degrees of intensity and speed as I play higher or lower on the clarinet. Um, you know, I'm really trying to follow the arc of the phrasing, the, the melody, and trying to just go with what it's trying to give me. Um, I also added some breath marks. So for these breath marks, I would play the trill, and then I would play to beat two, and then take a breath between the tie and then the next note that's changing. So, you know, like a lot of etudes in this book, there's not a lot of places to breathe. Um, I think he just assumed that everyone can circular breathe. Um, if everyone can circular breathe in 2020, awesome. I can circular breathe, but I did find it a little bit easier to add some breaths. So I added these throughout. Um, you can do what you want. But, you know, like with any etude, you know, you need to make it your own. It's like a homework sheet for the test. The test being the solo piece or the ensemble piece that you're working towards. So let these etudes be an exercise in practicing the expressiveness, the musicality, and those liberties that you would want to take in a solo piece that can be played with another person. And with that, we've reached the end of etude 14 in Victor Polachek's Advanced Studies for the Clarinet. Having reached the end of this masterclass, I hope you've gained a little bit of knowledge that prepares you for a magical performance down the road. In case you have any additional questions on this A2, as always, please feel free to comment below or send me an email. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching today, and I'll see you next time for A215. After practicing, stay safe and see you again soon.